So hello all, hello all. Welcome, welcome to the International Open Seminar on Semiotics, a tribute to John Dilly on the 50th anniversary of his passing. So I would like to welcome you, whether you are watching us live now or watching the recording on YouTube. Let me say that this collaborative international open scientific initiative and celebration connects a network of those and of personalities and organizations coming from various environments and with different profiles, all working in unison towards the advancements and propagation of semiotic studies. Today, we will have the presentation, the lecture titled Purse on History, Science and Realism by Professor Dr. Tulio Viola. Thank you, Professor Viola, for accepting our invitation. And we are also delighted to receive here Professor Dr. Donna E. West, who is going to make some insightful commentaries regarding Dr. Viola's presentation later today. Thank you, Professor Donna West, for being here. I also have to mention that after the presentation and the commentary, all people participating here on Zoom are welcome to share commentaries, insights, and questions about the lecture. So who, you who are watching this presentation here on Zoom are absolutely welcome to share your thoughts and questions later today. So I would like to introduce Professor Tulio Viola. Tulio Viola is an assistant professor in philosophy of art and culture at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. He has a doctorate in philosophy from the Humboldt University in Berlin. And before joining Maastricht University, he held postdoc positions in Berlin and Erfurt. He has published mainly on Peirce, North American pragmatism, and its links to European philosophy. His book, Peirce on the Uses of History, has come out with the Grutter in 2020. So he is the perfect person to talk about this the, the Peirce today. So I'm glad to invite Professor Viola. You can start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, William, for uh, the introduction, and uh, uh, Robert and William for the uh, for the invitation. I'm uh, extremely glad to be uh, to be here today. Thank you, uh, Donna West, for accepting uh, to be uh, the commentator to this uh, to this lecture, and I look forward to to the discussion. So I will now um, share my screen. Um, Can you all see it? Yes? Okay, I will now um, start my presentation, uh, whose title is uh, First on History, Science, and Realism. And as you may have already understood from the, uh, from the short introduction by um, William Passerini, uh, this talk, this lecture is based on my book, which um, came out a bit more than one year ago for the writer, and uh, the title of which is Purse on the Uses of History. I will try today to stress a few ideas that I try to capture in this book, um, especially the link with what I call Purse's realism about, uh, about the history, uh, about history in general and about the history of science in particular. The point of departure of this book was indeed the fact that Peirce is both um, a historian and a philosopher of science. Um, he is a philosopher on a broader scale. He is an important semiotician. He was, however, also a philosopher of science, which who thought that the philosophy of science should be uh, practiced in tight dialogue with the history of science. So starting from this idea, uh, starting from the attempt to unpack the implications of these ideas, I ended up trying to reconstruct um, the relation between historical knowledge and philosophy at large, not only philosophy and history of science, but rather what, are, what is the relevance of historical knowledge to uh, philosophy uh, in general in the work of Charles Sanders Peirce. Um, 
the book finds out in a way, my research finds out that there is a pluralism to um, Persis use of history, which is the reason why I ended up deciding that the title of the book should be actually in the plural, not so much Pers on the use of history, but rather on the different uses in the plural of history. There is a plurality of historical projects that Pers pursues along his life, not only in the history of science, but also touching on topics as diverse as the history of culture, the history of art, uh, biography. He was a very um, he was very interested in in biography as a as a literary genre, and there is also uh, alongside this plurality of historical projects, also a plurality of approaches to history and to what history can mean and why should why history can be relevant to philosophy. So unpacking the implications of this pluralism uh, of, and of this plurality of uses of history uh, for philosophy was the, was the main aim of this book. Now, what I will be talking about today, starting from this uh, material, I will try, however, to focus on two main themes, two main topics, that notwithstanding the pluralism, which I have just mentioned, are, I think, two guiding threads of uh, Peirce's whole work on history. And in a way, there are also two of the most important messages when we talk about why uh, Peirce's reflections, Peirce's remarks on the relationship between historical knowledge and philosophy could be actually relevant today to, you know, to debates, for instance, in, in the history of science, uh, in the philosophy of science, about, in fact, the inter intertwining between these two disciplines, historical disciplines and philosophy. These two major themes that I will be, uh, that I will be opening my lecture with are the topic of realism and the topic of processualism. What, what do these concepts mean? I will be talking about them a bit more at length in a second, but just let me anticipate realism. I understand realism here as a commitment to the idea that historical knowledge is knowledge of a reality in the strong sense of the word and a reality that cannot be written away, cannot be explained away and should be actually taken into account. Um, so it's a sort of um, uh, in a way, it's opposite to a more constructionist approach to history, which would uh, which would con which would maintain that history is in fact the construction, the subjective construction of the uh, of the inquirer, him or herself. I think that notwithstanding the fact that in Perth there are some construction constructionist insights that do uh, play a role uh, here and there the main thrust of his historical theory is a realist one. So this is the first idea that I would like to, to focus on a bit uh, today. The second one, which really gives, uh, I think it's specific imprint to Peirce's, uh, to Peirce's philosophy of history is his focus on processualism, on the idea that every um, entity in both nature and culture, both in the realm of nature and in the realm of mind, <coughs> should be actually understood first and foremost as a processual entity, as an event that unfolds over time, and that precisely because of this processual, na processual nature should be understood historically. So processualism in this sense is a sort of metaphysical or ontological view that opens up the very possibility for historical inquiry to be an inquiry that really goes into the heart of nature. Um, after having said a few things about realism and processualism throughout Peirce's work, I want to sort of try and give you a sense a bit more concretely of what it means for Peirce to have, uh, to cultivate this intermingling uh, of historical and philosophical projects. And I will be focusing on what I consider to be um, the most interesting uh, period of Peirce's intellectual production from the viewpoint I'm interested in, which is the early 1890s, in which really, if we look at uh, the things that Peirce wrote between 1891 and 1893, 94, you really find an extremely tight 
um, interplay of historical and philosophical preoccupations in a way that will, I hope, let you understand why I find this topic so important and so interesting to understand as a sort of key to understand Peirce's philosophy of science and Peirce's philosophy at large. Uh, after having said a few things about this, about this intermingling of historical and philosophical projects in the early 90s, I will be focusing on two main ideas which kind of come from that uh, context and are, are developed by Peirce also later on in his semiotic uh, writings and his, in his logical writings. Finally, I will be saying something on Peirce's, uh, what I think could be described as Peirce's, uh, in a way, Peirce's masterwork as a philosopher of history, which is a uh, relatively uh, late work on the logic of historiography, in which we will see that in a way, not only does history play a very significant role for philosophy and for logic, but the opposite relation holds as well. Philosophy and especially logical considerations are essential according to Peirce to um, frame a sound, um, a sound historical methodology. And I will be uh, closing with a few remarks that in a way go back to the question of realism and science with which I have opened up. Um, in a second. Okay, so let's focus, let's start by focusing on this uh, first uh, section of my lecture, the two main themes which I think are uh, offering a sort of guiding track to, um, to Peirce's work on, on history, uh, realism and processorism. Um, history for Peirce, we could start by, with this uh, very simple idea, history is first and foremost a science. History in the sense of writing, about and knowing the past is, of course, a very special form of learning and a very special form of science, but it is nonetheless to be inscribed within the realm of scientific knowledge. Scientific knowledge, in turn, is um, described by Peirce as um, an activity that changes characteristics in time. Peirce also from this respect was very attentive to historical change. He wasn't assuming that science is a sort of fixed entity um, throughout the centuries. But if there is one specificity of science that basically never changes, is it's being oriented to learning and finding out new things by means of a rational apparatus of inferences. Um, two, uh, I think, significant quotes. Uh, one is from one of the most important uh, works by the early Peirce, the, the very famous uh, paper on the fixation of belief, in which Peirce says in, 18, in 1877, the object of reasoning, I'm quoting uh, from that paper, is to find out from the consideration of what we already know, something else that we don't know. Now, this quote may seem simple and even trivial, and it is not. It is kind of conveying the very gist of what for Peirce should be understood to be um, uh, scientific reason. Um, again, two decades later, uh, Peirce defined science as, quote, the pursuit of those who are devoured by a desire to find things. Out. Now, why am I stressing so much this idea that science is about finding out and learning? We will see that this idea comes up again toward the end of my lecture, in which I focus on the methodology of historiographical inquiry for Peirce. Because Peirce, and this would be my contention, squarely places the activity of the historian within the domain of scientific activity. History is about finding out and learning new things about the past. This gives a strong realistic uh, thrust to Peirce's uh, understanding of history. History is less about revising, reconstructing the past according to the subjectivity of the historian, even though that, that, uh, that perspective is also to be taken into account. And it is really aimed at in a way, building a consensus about what, what really happened in the past um, among researchers. Now, 
this is based on a metaphysical assumption. This is based on the assumption that the past is not something that the historian him or herself constructs, but it is something that is in a way out there. It is real in the same way in which um, the external world that is inquired into by empirical knowledge is real. Even though, of course, then I, I, I will not be able to go into all the metaphysical and ontological problems that this sort of analogy um, opens up and which pers is, and of which person is indeed aware, of course. But I would say, to simplify a bit things, that as a general claim, Peirce is actually arguing that the past is something that can exert the same kind of constraint over our cognitive processes that the real world investigated by the external world, sorry, investigated by the experimental sciences can exert on our inferential reason. Um, in 1902, in, the, in, the, in, a, in, a logical, in a logical manuscript, he, he writes, if you complain to the past that it is wrong and unreasonable, it lacks. It doesn't care a snap of the finger for reason. What does it mean? It means, I take that idea to mean that the past is something that is pre-logical, pre-rational, in the sense that it's not constructed by human rationality, and it does not care a snap of the finger whether it is rational or not. It is just there and needs to be accounted for by the story. Um, now, I, I already suggested the idea uh, I, I'm just about to mention, uh, but this strong realistic and scientific presupposition uh, um, um, in a way implies that there is something like, I'm calling here an epistemic convergence, meaning a consensus about what actually happened in the past, what actually we as historians should write about, that at least in theory can be reached. Um, there is this emphasis on convergence, the possibility to find out the truth about the past. Now, however, what I really want to stress is that even though I'm, I'm laying so much emphasis on this realistic uh, scaffolding of Peirce's uh, philosophy of history, I don't want to give the misguided impression that Peirce is just a radical objectivist about history who thinks that, you know, the past is just out there to be reconstructed in a sort of hyper positivistic way, uh, a little bit like in the very famous uh, sentence by German historian Leopold von Hanke, uh, who said the past, we should reconstruct the past via eigentlich gewesen is, as it really, as it really uh, happened. Now, this idea, I think, is not capturing the spirit of Peirce's realism. And I will be coming back to, to this uh, at the end of my lecture, when I will try to show to you what it means for Peirce to write history. Let's say for now just this. For Peirce, there is an inferential machinery and inferential method that you should apply to knowing the past, which is very similar, which is very analogous to the kind of inferential method and experimental method that you apply to knowing all other forms of empirical reality. In this sense, he is a profound realist, not in the sense that he thinks that the past can be narrated and reconstructed once and for all from a purely, uh, from a radically objectivist uh, position. Um, let me now go to uh, go on to say a few things about the other concept I want to introduce um, at the beginning of this lecture, the, the, the idea of processualism. Um, processualism in the sense of Peirce can be understood as, uh, as he says once, uh, an instinctive attraction for living facts, for the fact of life. Life is a process itself and life becomes the model, the paradigm, to understand, in fact, all forms of um, philosophically significant phenomena, both in the realm of nature and in the realm of mind. Um, nature, symbols, and ideas, concepts are living and growing things. 
they are processes that unfold over time and that for this reason should be understood um, historically, should be inquired into, first of all, um, historically. Um, now, there is a big influence behind versus processualism, which I think um, should be uh, mentioned right away, which is uh, the evolutionary theory of Charles Darwin. Uh, first was, uh, this is very well known, first was 20 years old when uh, the origin of species appeared and he, uh, he read that book and uh, um, that book was, his, was an extremely significant event, reading that book, studying that book, discussing that book with peers and colleagues and, and later on going back to that book a number of times was an, was an important intellectual event that uh, in a way marked the, the whole history of pragmatism and North American philosophy. John Dewey is probably the philosopher who has written the most remarkable things about the impact of Darwinism. Uh, for philosophy from a pragmatist perspective. However, I think, and so the evolutionism, the idea that's, that, that nature and, and by extension mind and culture should be understood, first of all, evolutionarily, is something that comes from, uh, from Darwinism, not only from Darwinism, of course, from a general evolutionary mindset of the late 19th century, but Darwin, catalyzed um, and made powerful uh, an idea that was, uh, that was uh, available to Peirce uh, in, in, from, from different uh, directions. But Peirce's allegiance to Darwinism is never, is never, a, um, is never, uh, is never complete in a way. He's not, uh, and will never be a 100% Dar Darwinist. He is, uh, actually a strongly radically evolutionary thinker, but someone who actually tries to go beyond Darwinism, to go beyond the Darwinian model of natural selection when he wants to try and frame a sort of uh, general evolutionary metaphysics that could uh, be applied to both nature and culture. So the other important name here to understand, I think, why Peirce was both very much attracted to Darwinian evolutionism and also somehow willing to reconsider, to correct it, to refuse it even in some respect, is um, one of his teachers at Cambridge, Massachusetts, when he was still a very young person, uh, the naturalist, uh, the Swiss American naturalist, Louis Agassiz, who in a way was a, a very strong and very authoritative adversary of Darwin. And, what I try to do in my book is uh, understand Peirce's intellectual development, especially in the first decades of his life, as a sort of oscillation between these two important figures, these two important models. On the one hand, Darwin and in general, 19th century evolutionism as a sort of revolutionary perspective on both science and philosophy that made, in fact, processualism possible in a sense. And on the other hand, uh, uh, and this uh, more um, essentialist, anti-evolutionarist viewpoint that was embodied by Louis Agassiz, his teacher at Cambridge, whom Peirce couldn't actually uh, believe in anymore, but, and this would be my, my claim, in a way stayed with him throughout his life as a sort of uh, devil's advocate against the uh, against evolutionary perspectives in nature and mind. And I'm saying all this because I want to give a sense of the fact that Peirce's processualism is never a position that kind of erases completely um, the possibility to give also a non-processual account of things. We will see in which sense this becomes important when Peirce talks about the relation between history and logic. But still, nonetheless, he is a profoundly processualist thinker who um, thinks that um, it is possible, it is desirable to reach um, a metaphysical understanding of the world, of nature and of mind as processes that unfold in time. There is a third, uh, related to this issue, there is a third influence and the intellectual figure that I would like to mention before going on, uh, who in a way is caught up uh, similarly in, in this sort of, um, debate and discussion about um, 
evolutionary thinking toward the end of the 19th century and what kind of implications this evolutionary thinking should have for uh, uh, for the history, uh, for the for the study of history and for the relation between history and philosophy. And this is the British polymath and scientist William Muir, who um, first regarded as one of the most important thinkers when it comes to understanding what kind of history we should be aiming to, to write. Ewell was uh, somebody who uh, stressed very much the importance for the philosopher of science to always look into the very history of the sciences that he was uh, philosophizing about. Um, he was not a Darwinian thinker at all, but he was in fact um, trying to make the philosophy of science more uh, sensitive to history and to um, to an evolutionary understanding of scientific ideas. Um, so, um, processualism as a sort of key to person's philosophy and to person's attention to history, but a processualism that somehow includes within itself a sort of um, complexity, which uh, I am trying to drive back or to bring back to to the influence of this uh, of this other important thinker, uh, Louis Agassiz, and this sort of more anti-evolutionary uh, understanding of nature. Um, now, all this, this realistic and, and processualist understanding of, um, uh, of, of the world, in fact, um, somehow um, is realized or, or, or gives its best fruits uh, toward the beginning of the um, last, last decade of the 19th century, when Peirce is already um, a, uh, a mature philosopher, he's already written some of the most important things uh, that we remember him for. And um, he's actually starting the second, the second part of his, uh, of his uh, intellectual life in which uh, he stops uh, working at universities. He, uh, he, he becomes more and more a sort of secluded and private philosopher who writes an enormous amount of things, but uh, many of which are not even published. Um, toward the very beginning of this, uh, of this decade, of the 1890s, there are three projects that somehow cannot be understood in isolation, should be really understood together. The most important one is well, not the most important one, but let's say the most famous one is the one on the uh, right, top right corner of my slide, where, which scholars normally refer to as the Monist speculative series. Monist because it was a series of papers published in the philosophical journal, the Monist, and speculative because its subject matter is quite uh, speculative and metaphysical. In this Monist speculative series, um, Peirce sketches uh, what I would call an evolutionary philosophy of mind and nature, who, which um, indeed takes on this sort of Darwinian, but also post-Darwinian, in a sense, uh, uh, attitude and applies it to an enormous uh, um, number of, of different phenomena to, from uh, uh, from from the physiology of living beings to historical events to the evolution of mind to uh, the evolution of the cosmos and the universe, um, the what I consider to be the centerpiece of this uh, metaphysical series are the three papers uh, entitled "Evolutionary Love," which is really about giving a sort of post-Darwinian um, or constructing a sort of post-Darwinian model of um, of nature and the evolution. Uh, the law of mind, which focuses on the same kind of evolutionary model, but looking into phenomena like habit acquisition and the formation of concepts and ideas. And then the architecture of theories, which in a way opens the series with, uh, with a number of methodological uh, considerations that I would like to talk about in a sec. Now, this is very famous. This is one of the most important pieces of philosophy. If you're interested in Peirce, you certainly know these writings. What you 
might not know is the fact that these papers, these writings were written at the very moment in which Peirce was, was working on another important project, a series of lectures, and this is the left corner of my slide, a series of lectures to be delivered at the Lowell Institute in Boston, Massachusetts, on the history of science. Uh, first uh, wrote two main series of lectures on the history of science. One is 1892, and this is the one that I'm talking about. They are called Lowell Lectures on the History of Science, and one, uh, one another series a few years later. Now, what is interesting about this series, if you look at it um, together with the evolutionary, with the monist speculative series, is that there is a sense in which the two series of, of writings deal with exactly the same topic, namely the evolution of mind. Um, only what the monist speculative series does from an indeed a speculative viewpoint, the lectures on the history of science do from a historical and empirical viewpoint by looking into the history, especially of ancient civilizations, uh, but also of early modern science uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, this is why I am inclined uh, to, to call these lectures on the history of science an empirical counterpart to the metaphysical project. Now, of course, if you think that there is a metaphysical project that needs an empirical counterpart, you are already making a claim, a sort of methodological or philosophical claim about how the two things can go together, how metaphysics can be accompanied by um, history um, and, and in empirical knowledge in general. And this is captured, I think, by a series of different uh, I'm calling them meta-theoretical reflections. This is the top uh, side of my diagram on the link between these two projects, on metaphys the link between metaphysics and science. Uh, there is, um, at the very beginning of the, uh, of the lectures on the history of science, Peirce begins by offering a classification of the science. This is a project that Peirce would go on to work on um, for at least a decade, if not more. But it starts here. It starts at the very beginning of the 1890s. And I am interpreting this interest in classifying the, the scientific discipline as a sign of the fact that he's trying to reflect on how these two different disciplines, metaphysical philosophy on the one hand and, uh, and empirical knowledge of the human past on the other, go together. Uh, then there is a second uh, second project which is important that goes back to the title of the third paper I'm, uh, uh, I quoted bef uh, uh, beforehand, the architecture of theory. First, in this year, developed what uh, what he calls an architectonic concept or uh, conception of philosophy. Now, this idea of the architectonics goes back to Kant, right? To this idea of philosophy being uh, having to uh, to, to be built uh, in, a, in a systematic fashion. But Peirce understands this idea of architectonic in a slightly different way. And I would like to emphasize two points here. First of all, yes, let's take, uh, let's say literally this idea of the architectonic. Philosophy is like a build, building a, a system of philosophy is like building a piece of architecture. But this piece of architecture, um, should be built in such a way that it uh, it uh, it will last for as long as, as as much time as possible. But it's never an eternal building. There will come a time in which this building will need to either be completely restructured or maybe even to be torn down and rebuilt in a completely different fashion. And this is actually what Peirce very literally says about the metaphysics of Aristotle. Per says the greatness of Aristotle is the fact that he managed to build a system of philosophy that basically um, lasted for uh, centuries and centuries, but it, the time has come to make substantive uh, restructuration to, to this bill. Uh, and this is sort of the first remark I would like to make because it gives you a sense of the fact that Peirce was a was a historically minded scholar, not only in the sense that he wanted to make history relevant 
to philosophical inquiry, but also in the sense that he was mindful of the fact that philosophy itself has an historicity to it. When you do philosophy, you do something that will live in time and will probably, as many other things in, in the world, have a life and, and come to an end and then will be substituted by something else. Uh, and the second point, which is very important about this architectonic conception of philosophy, is that it is the space within which Peirce reflects on the fact that in order to build a philosophical edif edifice, uh, a building, an a piece of architecture, you need to actually draw from concrete material, from the bricks that are provided to you by the empirical sciences. So again, here, this is a sort of metaphor that persons uses in order to make it possible for us to understand how philosophical considerations can be, uh, can be actually developed together with the development of empirical, uh, the, the inquiry into the empirical world. And then there are a few sparse remarks on histories relevant to logic and philosophy, which I want to now um, uh, delve deeper into uh, in a second, but let's say that first, the moment he starts writing these lower lectures on the history of science, very often kind of poses to give a few remarks on why he's actually doing that. And we will see that the gist of the problem is that he thinks that history um, can give important lessons to science, to practicing scientists and practitioners of logic. So logic is a discipline that, as the classification of the science says, is autonomous from history. There is no uh, way of sort of drawing logic from history, but at the same time, history gives a lot of material, provides a lot of material to uh, the working scientists and the working logicians. And I am going to say a few words on how that is possible in a second. So this is the, I think, one of the most interesting and important moments. If you are interested in this interplay and dialogue between historical, the history of science, and in general historical knowledge, and the development of Peirce's philosophy, these years, 1892, 1893, are really a very, very important period to to study. Um, now. I said a few things about the classification of the science. This is one of the uh, of Perth's, uh, beautiful manuscripts uh, on the classification of the science taken from a wonderful paper by my colleague uh, Chiara Ambrosio, uh, an associate professor at UCL in London on the historicity of Perth's classification of the science, a paper that was uh, extremely important for my work. Um, um, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this manuscript because I want to say something about the very way in which the very strategy by means of which Peirce thought that a classification of the science was possible. Because in a way, this is a symptom of a more general historical strategy that he uses when he does philosophy and logic. Um, as I said already that for first pragmatism and, and philosophy had to be driven by an instinctive attraction for living facts. And these living facts are in fact processes that unfold in time that, uh, and that can be understood only historically. Um, now, this is in fact what he calls uh, natural history or sometimes genealogy. Genealogy or natural history is indeed the study of process of growth and creation as a means to understand the real division, the real feature of what he calls natural classes. Now, now what does all this have to do with the classification of the sciences? The answer is quite, is quite straightforward. For Peirce, the sciences, the scientific discipline are themselves natural classes. They are not purely conventional things. They are not purely arbitrary um, ideas or purely sociological ideas that we've come uh, up with um, just as a means to systematize academic work uh, in the late 19th century. No, there is something more about it. And this, this idea, in fact, goes back to 
to the to the, one of the influence I mentioned before, William Ewell, the, the British polymath and scientist who who had a similar idea about the sciences. So, and this gives you already a sense of why, even when, while doing the classification of the sciences, Persis wanted to proceed historically. Persis wanted to look at the history of the sciences in order to understand what the real lines of division are um, between the different sciences. Now, this method, which is genealogical, as he calls it, as he calls it yes, are, is not indeed logical analysis, but it's also not a purely causal narrative that only looks uh, in a sort of positivistic fashion at the, at the development of the different, in this case of the different scientific disciplines, but it could be a, it could be a completely different domain of inquiry because for him, this idea that nature should be, should be investigated genealogically in a way applies to many different uh, to many different domains. Why is it not a purely causal narrative? Because it it looks at the development of uh, natural classes and also look at how these natural classes will actually develop in the future. So genealogy is a sort of methodology of inquiry that looks both at the uh, development of a certain natural class in the past and at, the, at its potential potential growth in the future so i am understanding this genealogical uh, approach or this natural history if you want as a sort of intermediate stage between a purely historical narrative that only looks at historical data and puts that uh, puts them in a sort of diachronic series and a purely logical analysis that kind of uh, brackets of completely narrative and historical considerations to only try to divide the world into, into logical classes. One could ask, why is genealogy actually uh, necessary in the first place? Why shouldn't we be uh, content with the, with the idea that the world can be investigated by means of logical division? Now, there are a number of answers that Peirce gives to this, to this but there, is, there are two that uh, I think are particularly important. The first one is that natural classes have a certain vagueness to them. Vagueness, as many of you uh, already know, is an important uh, is an important concept in Persis logic and in Persis semiotics, but is also important in his metaphysical uh, project. There is an indeterminacy to the natural classes, um, which in a way escapes purely logical division, purely logical analysis, and and in a way calls, calls upon genealogical consideration in order to, to trace this, uh, the, the boundaries of these natural classes over time. And the second one I already, I already mentioned is the fact that na natural classes are never static objects, are always in a state of perpetual self-realization. Self um, there is a sense in which they are in fact uh, teleological, teleological entities. I will not go into this point because it, it will open up a completely different uh, uh, scenario, but let's say they are in a state of perpetual self-realization. And, and this, this self-realization, this continuing development can only be grasped, according to Perez, by a more genealogical now, uh, there is a, a debate with John Dewey, with a, fragment, with a very young uh, John Dewey over logic as a natural history, which is interesting from my perspective, because you, from, from all I have said uh, right now, you could uh, imagine that first was just advocating the idea of, uh, of a natural history uh, as, as the only method of logic. In fact, this is not true. In fact, first was was thinking that Dewey, who stressed also very much this idea of natural history in logic, was going too far in this, in this idea, was, was, was threatening to reduce the whole of logic to, to a genealogical consideration. And for first, this would be a mistake. So for me, this is important. Remember what I said before about this sort of opposition or oscillation between a more evolutionist or Darwinian perspective and a more essentialist perspective, anti-evolutionist perspective, which is related to, um, to this other important name, uh, the name of Louis Agassiz. In a way, this, this sort of oscillation comes back uh, many years later 
when the, the person on the one hand defends the method of natural history, but on the other says to his colleague, to his younger colleague, John Dewey, don't go too far to that. Don't reduce logic to natural history. Natural history is important to, to logic, but it's not the only method that you should be using. Logic as an essence that cannot be reduced to its history. What is this essence? The essence is, is basically its normative character. The fact that you can say something is a sound logical argument as opposed to something that is not a sound logical argument is not something, this sort of primitively normative fact about logic that cannot be derived from history. And then there would be a second point, which is the fact that logic grasps some essential structures of thought, um, which can be um, which can be depicted in the most per perspicuous way by means of diagrams. This is very well known to many of you, probably, but this touches upon uh, Peirce's work as a as a diagrammatic uh, logician, and uh, and that again, this is this is the closest you can get to the essence of thought structures, which again, you cannot derive from genealogical consideration. So again, you see this kind of oscillation in his work uh, about, about uh, the, the link between history and logic. Now, uh, I'm going to, to go a bit quicker here because I want to uh, try and finish uh, the whole, the whole uh, arc that I'm trying to draw, but this is already, um, the first step toward understanding why, um, for for Peirce, logic should actually have a vital connection to empirical disciplines like psychology, linguistic, and history, but never a connection that reduces the kernel of logic to these disciplines. Psychologism is the concept that comes uh, most quickly to the mind here. Peirce was in fact, an adversary of psychologism. If you mean by psychologism, the idea that you can, you can take the laws of psychology and use them as the laws of logic. He thinks there is no way to go from psychology to logic. In fact, the other way around should be, should be the correct one. You should go from logic to psychology. And the same, uh, the same applies to linguistic considerations. So logic can never become an empirical discipline in the sense that it's just an analysis of language. However, both in the case of psychology and in the case of language, that this doesn't mean that empirical considerations should be discarded. So in this way, I, I often think that person psychologism is quite different from other forms of early 20th century psychologism, like that of Edmund Husserl, for instance, or, uh, or uh, Gottlob Frege, who I think are much more radical in, in dividing the empirical world from the logical world. For Peirce, this, this boundary is, is in fact there, but is fuzzy. And Psychological and linguistic data should by no means be discarded because it's empirical observation as a crucial philosophical input. Empirical observation, you can never draw logic from empirical observation, but empirical observation needs to inform your philosophical considerations at every step. Remember the metaphor of the architectonic system that I mentioned a few minutes ago. That's basically the same idea. Let me now uh, quickly read one of the uh, passages that I very much like to cite about this because I think there's something poetic about it. It's a passage in which of a, of a 1906 manuscript in which Peirce reflects on the possibility for empirical knowledge to be a sort of, uh, he uses this metaphor of the little mouse that enters into your theory and does not destroy it though. It makes it richer. It makes it more um, complex and therefore more realistic. There is a lesson in logic, he says in this uh, manuscript. A uh, manuscript uh, first edited by uh, the Finnish lo uh, logician uh, Ati Pietarin. Namely, that one may lay down the very best of definitions, going to the very heart of things. And yet there will be, as it were, a little living ma mouse of a quasi-exception, which will found or make a hole to get in when all seemed hermetically closed. This mouse will not be a mere pest to be, to be got rid of, and forgotten, it will be a fellow being to be remembered and to be appraised. This living little mouse is empirical knowledge. Okay, I think that's my interpretation. 
Now, empirical knowledge becomes even more important when it's empirical knowledge about the past. Why? Because there is a field of logic which Peirce often calls ampliative reason. And we, you could translate as the logic of discovery, the logic which is not con content with deductive reasoning, but is really about uh, applying logical inferences to as a means to learning new things about the world. We go back to what I was saying at the beginning of the lecture, which cannot really be cultivated uh, if you don't have a, a profound and robust historical consciousness. History uh, provides us with what Peirce calls practical lessons about the very inferential structure of science, about what is good and what is bad in, uh, in, uh, in your apply applications of the inferential machinery with which per, with, out of which science uh, of which science is composed. Uh, it provides us what, um, what we could call a map of all legitimate forms of arguments over and above what you can understand sort of a priori by an analysis of the three forms of arguments, according to Peirce, deductive reasonings, inductive reasonings, and uh, the production of hypotheses or, or abductions. It provides you a much more fine-grained and complex map of, how, of, of all the valid forms of reasoning. And then there is another point, which I call in my book, uh, an optimistic meta-abduction. This is a, a drawing on the work of Umberto Eco, who uh, firstly, um, firstly uh, formulated this idea of the meta-abduction, recently taken up by uh, Francesco Bellucci in Bologna. Um, the meta-abduction is basically an abduction about the very possibility that we make abductions. For those of you who are not familiar with person's terminology, abduction is nothing less that, or, well, let's put it a bit simpler. It's like hypothesis. It's what I do when I make an hypothesis about something that I don't know. For a person, I'm making an abduction. Now, a meta-abduction will be making an hypothesis about the very fact of making a hypothesis. And what is this hypothesis? It's an optimistic belief that hypothesis can reach the truth. Okay, so only by means of historical study seems to be saying, per seems to be saying, at least in my interpretation, can you reach the conclusion that you, our ability to make hypothesis about the world is going to bring us closer to the truth in the long run. Now, this means, uh, I'm running a bit late, but this means uh, reaching the conclusion. This also means something subtle about the very concept of scientific truth. It is, seems this idea, this optimism about the fact that we in science, we are all concerned all have always been concerned with actually producing truths about the world. It seems to be predicated on a very optimistic belief that what was truth in the past and what we know today not to be truth anymore because science evolves, because scientific paradigms change, in a way was still an approximation to the truth which, are, which has brought us closer to a better understanding of, nat of nature. And in this respect, let me let me quote one of the many significant passages that 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 encapsulates this this idea. Um, it's about the history of astronomy. Um, 1898. This is uh, uh, on an, in an historical manuscript. Um, since Hipparchus' hypothesis was, which today we know to be false, to be completely you know outdated, but per se. Since his hypothesis was an inevitable and ineluctable step toward the truth, it was in fact true, although its truth was destined to be swallowed up in the completer truths, first of Ptolemy's bisected equal, and then of the hypothesis of Copernicus, and then of Kepler's ellipse. This is something like Hegel's half of him. Now, you see why the allusion to Hegel, because it's an evolutionary perspective in which truth is never found out only to be discarded, but in a way, even those things that today we know to be false were in a sense true because they have to be understood against their own historical context and because they, they somehow 
helped us attain better truths later on. So there is this strong, again, this strong evolutionary sense uh, that, uh, or sensitivity that permeates Percy's work. I am uh, reaching the conclusion of my talk. Um, I hope I've given you a sense of how starting from the 1890s, uh, Peirce really works on this problem of the relevance of history to philosophy and especially of the relevance of history to logic, finding ways in which though the two disciplines are separated from one another and shouldn't in fact be confused, this is important. He was not a radical historicist in this sense. Nevertheless, there are a myriad of links between them. And I have investigated in particular the sense in which history is relevant to logic, but of course it's a circular movement, right? And the, the, the opposite direction is as valid as the first. Logic is relevant to history. This is beautifully captured by one of the most important treatises that occurs in the later years of his career wrote, which is entitled On the Logic Drawing History from Ancient Documents, especially from Testimonies, 1901. Now, here again, Peirce's strong and robust realism comes to the fore against what he calls subjectivism, which would be a sort of attitude which he thinks is particularly widespread among German scholars and German philosophers. Edward Zeller is one of his uh, most favorite polemical objectives. Um, a sort of inclination to weigh evidence just according to your subjective impression of how trust, trustworthy these evidences were. And for Peirce, this is absolutely to be rejected as a method. Now, independently of, of, uh, of whether Peirce was, was right in judging Zella and the German historical criticism school like this, the important point for me is that his proposed solution is again to actually bring the writing of history much closer to the experimental sciences. History is just about making hypotheses about the past the way a physicist makes hypotheses about nature. Um, history should give an account of the existence of all the evidences that we have, like a scientist that goes there, out there and makes experiments about the natural world. And it should formulate abductions or, or hypotheses that are subsequently put to an inductive test. Uh, Archaeology becomes very important here because archaeology, especially when you write about ancient history for Persis, is the closest you can get to a sort of an experimental test. Do you really want to know whether Troy was a city in the middle, uh, in the middle, in the, in the in the eastern part of the Mediterranean world, which underwent a series of catastrophes and so on? You have to dig in order to find out. You cannot just know from a sort of analysis of documents. So it's, it's like when you, want, you have to do an experiment in order to find out whether a certain natural law is true or not. That also means, second point, that there is a much stronger attention to history as a discovery or a certain amount of facts rather than to history as a sort of interpretation and narrative of facts that we already know. For Peirce, history is first and foremost giving a reconstruction of what happened. And then, of course, as, as, as all of you know who have been studying uh, Peirce, discovery, discovery and interpretation are not to be separated from one another. But still, there is a stronger emphasis on discovery, especially in his methodological right. And finally, going back to what I said at the very beginning of the lecture, this realism and this scientism about history is not to be understood as a sort of radical objectivist uh, position. Peirce is not saying that you can only write history about things that you are certain about. And in order to illustrate that, he actually takes a highly speculative example, like reconstructed the biography of ancient philosophers. He even writes about Pythagoras. Pythagoras is a man that we know almost nothing about. And still, precisely because of this, Peirce wanted to kind of test his experimental machinery about history to a sort of limiting case, okay? In which you, you almost have no idea what happened to Pythagoras, but if you actually apply the right experimental method, you can say something logically sound about it, about him. So let me write, and I will close with this, uh, with this quote. Um, in the case of the life of Pythagoras, he, he writes in the uh, 
in this treatise on the logic of drawing history from ancient documents, we must, we must renounce at the very outset any attempt to reach anything approach, approaching certainty. Yet we are not to aim at very similitudes, right? So it's not that since there is no certainty, then we can say anything. No, which are merits in romances, but not in scientific results. What then are we to do? We are to embody all the pertinent facts in such a hypothesis as best unifies them and will serve as a source of experimental predictions whenever in the future it may be in our power to verify or refute any predictions on the subject. I think this um, embodies very well Percy's idea that science is always about the future. Again, it's a living thing, it's a growing thing, it's something that has to do with this, uh, this profoundly evolutionary ideas that moved his philosophy. You, you try to be as sound, as logically correct as possible about something that you almost know nothing about in the hope that in the future, things will clarify because something will happen and you will be in a better position and you, it will be in your power to verify or refute any predictions that you have made about this subject. Okay. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Uh, it was a real pleasure. And sorry for being a bit uh, a bit long. Thanks. Dr. Tullio Viola, thank you. It was a brilliant presentation, really. I think we'll have a great dialogue today with the people present here. But first, we have a special guest, Professor Dr. Donna E. West. Oh, no. We will start uh, present some, but let me first present uh, introduce Dr. Donna West. So Dr. Donna West is professor of linguistics at the State University of New York, Cortland. For nearly 40 years, she has presented and published internationally on Persian semiotics. She currently serves on the board of the International Association for Cognitive Semiotics, as well on several editorial boards. Her book, uh, Deitic Imaginings, Semiosis at Work and at Play investigates the ontogeny of indexical signs. Her 2016 edited volume of, on Peirce's concept of habit offers a fresh global perspective. Scholar, uh, she is likewise editing the mathematic, mathematics and cognition section for the handbook on cognitive mathematics. Her own contributions explore, explores the formidable role of chunking in abductive rationality. Following the 2021 publication of, of two guest edited journal issues on person consciousness, her forthcoming book presents retrospective narratives as a scaffold toward the person's retroductive logic. So thank you, Professor uh, Donna West. You can start your commentary. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I wanna say it was an absolute thrill to read um, uh, Dr. Uh, Viola's book. Um, it was exceedingly well written and uh, very thought provoking uh, for, I believe, um, scholars who are at the height of their career, as well as those who are beginning. And um, that's often not the case. So I really think he's uh, left us with a legacy. Um, and the issue that I want to begin with, I don't want to take too much time, but uh, to try uh, to consolidate and synthesize what Dr. Viola has left us with is the issue of um, time as a process. And that is not from past to present to future, but he said very eloquently that the past, present, and future must be stitched into an indecomposable unit. And I thought that was a really um, very apt statement of how Peirce uh, views the way in which we, uh, as individuals try to stitch together um, realities uh, on a semiotic level. And so 
I'm going to uh, focus on one primary, but I think uh, something that pervades um, notion that Dr. Viola brought out regarding purse, and that is that purse favors the public as a over, I should say, not necessarily as opposed to, but public over private uh, considerations and not again, um, that private considerations do not have their place, especially in developing issues of uh, abductions, uh, inferences, uh, especially instinctual ones that might come from an individual, but uh, afterwards, certainly um, they must be, um, they must go through the process of the past, present, and future. And this is again where Peirce's realism comes into play. And so in chapter three of um, Dr. Viola's book, um, he emphasizes the uh, that there there's, has to be a balance in the process um, of gaining inferences and, and, and ideas which have any measure of truth. Um, and that is objective chance, um, efficient causation, determinism, and um, the teleology of agapistic um, approaches. And that, uh, the teleology, the aspect of, of the teleology focuses on the enrichment and betterment of ideas which were presented in the past, but they, they aren't static. And so this is where Purse and uh, when Dr. Viola talks about the issue in introduces the issue in chapter three of the growth of thought, um, I and and of course uh, in in the growth of thought the uh, issue of habit change you begin with a belief but um, are open to uh, belief change. And, and so um, in doing that, um, it, it, Dr. Viola discusses the issue of symbols as a primary agent in that growth. And I'm not going to um, really disagree with that. I think it's, it's critical in going from the private to the public or the public to the private back to the uh, public. And that is to corroborate um, the, the uh, facts or, and or in, uh, data uh, that we do have um, and make it what uh, Dr. Viola refers to as a monument, something objective that can be uh, accepted uh, by our, our, our scientific contemporaries and also um, that, that that is a, um, a refinement, if you will, of something from the past. And so in 1909, Peirce, and this was in Dr. Viola's book, um, Peirce refers uh, two, it was in HP uh, 37, in 1909, a letter to Lady Welby, where he discusses um, how it is that some of this process takes place. And that is by, and I'm going to paraphrase somewhat, uh, by the penetration of uh, the thoughts of our predecessors but not merely 
as our predecessors understood them, rather um, to extract the potencies of those thoughts. And so um, that's the essence, I think, of processualism on a semiotic level. And I would um, just add that it isn't merely a sim the symbol that provides us with that potency. It's actually Peirce's interpretant. And in Peirce's later writings in 1906 and 1908, um, he makes that very clear that even indices as subjects and or scenes can have implied predicates. And those implied predicates are in fact uh, reinterpretations and or uh, additions or subtractions or whatever they might be uh, to perhaps um, the thoughts as our predecessors understood them and the process uh, of um, that process is highlighted um, certainly by Peirce's notion of the continuum in that um, we should all as agapism would dictate um, look for the truth. And in looking for the truth, um, we um, can and have the licensure and are encouraged to make this a process over generations and to use not just symbolic signs, but indexical ones as um, we can re reinterpret uh, indices even at a, a more basic level such that their meanings and or effects uh, that, that are perceived, the, the connections between what is the, um, the, the consequence, the surprising consequence, and what is the antecedent or set of antecedents to that uh, is a process that uh, we will always need to adhere to from a person perspective. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I, I thank you all for the means to comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dono S. Please, Dr. Tur, if you want to say anything. Thank you so much, first of all, for the, for the reading and for your comments. Uh, I'm going to say maybe just a few things and because I think it's, uh, it's then uh, equally interesting to, to open up the discussion uh, a little bit. But uh, there are a few things uh, which you said um, which are really vital to the project. So um, in a way, I said something about the sort of broader evolutionary perspective, right? Um, which in a sense, this is the, the third chapter of my book from out of which you, you quoted a few passages. Um, in a sense, is the backbone of Persis' interest in history, right? Persis' interest in history for me has two, two main uh, components. The first one is processualism and evolutionary, uh, the, an evolutionary account of nature. And on the other hand, there is this idea which is encapsulated in this quote uh, of the little mouse, which I mentioned before, that um, empirical knowledge, and also that means also empirical knowledge of the past, is never a threat to speculative thought or to abstract thought, but is always uh, at least in pot potentially an enrichment. And, the philosopher's task is that of articulating in what sense this enrichment can be understood. But to go back to evolution, evolution, you mentioned a few concepts which I didn't have the space to, 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 to discuss, but which are absolutely crucial to understand 
what this evolutionary uh, perspective actually, uh, how, how, what it looks like. Uh, the first is the concept of habit. Habit is so important. One of the many reasons why habit is so important in the uh, philosophy of birds, uh, over and above questions related to pragmatism that are very well known, is the fact that habit has this historicity built into its very core. Habit is made possible by repetition and continuity in time. And at the same time, habit out of repetition and continuity in time, habit becomes a general rule, what Peirce would call a thirdness, a general rule, which are, however, is never completely detached from its um, particular instances. In other words, let's imagine I have a habit of uh, waking up very late in the morning. Um, if I want to modify that habit, there is no other way but to start waking up earlier in the morning, which might seem like a, a vicious circle, but it's not because in the habit, in habit-like structures, the rule is always governing individual instances, but individual instances like actual behavior, actual, you know, actual concrete uh, manifestations of the habit can always kind of feed back into the habit and change it. And so this sort of evolutionary, this sort of processual perspective is a processual perspective in which there is always a, a spiral from the general to the particular and, and so on and so on. Um, and this is crucial to understand Peirce's versus, uh, versus processual account of, of nature and mind. Um, about the symbol, I think, yes, without, without stressing the notion of the interpretant, this processualism couldn't even start because the interpretant in a way is that which makes it possible for a sign and for a symbol a fortiori to be the member of uh, the part, part of a chain, a link of a chain. The interpretant of a sign is, as we, as, we, as we know, has itself a semiotic nature and is itself embedded in within a semiotic chain. Um, um, finally, the um, the question of uh, you, you mentioned at the beginning of your of your comments um, the very the very um, the the details of Peirce's understanding of evolutionism uh, of evolutionary theory by saying in Peirce's evolutionary framework there is space for objective chance there is space for efficient causation and there is space for something that he calls teleology. When he titles his paper Evolutionary Law, he's in fact at, um, addressing this idea that there is something that is not natural selection, that is not necess necessary mechanism or determinism, which however is an important engine of human evolution, in particular of uh, the evolution of mind, of what we could call today a cultural evolution, right? And this is this sort of attraction that, that ideas can have force of attraction that ideas can have. And you can only understand that for Peirce, according to Peirce, um, within a teleological framework. Now, if you then go back to his history of science in a way, and this I think has been overlooked a little bit by, by scholars, um, you find Peirce really struggling to find instances of that, to find instances of the fact that if the, the thought, scientific thought in particular, never proceeds purely by means of a sort of mechanism or deterministic structure, neither does it proceed by means of purely natural, natural selection in, the, in a sort of Darwinian sense, but it also proceeds by the fact that ideas have a force by themselves, which again, like in the example of habit, is never completely detached from secondness, from effectual realities, but still, governs them and informs them and provide and, and presides over them so i'll stop the i'll stop here and thank you very much uh, for this uh, for these comments um yeah okay so we'll we'll continue this uh, this conversation but let me say that we are going to close the broadcast on youtube but here on zoom it's uh, we'll continue let me say first that the next presentation is called Mind and Cognition at the Play in the Semiotics of Purse by Prof. Professor Dr. Lucia Santaella.
which will take place in February 12, 2022. You can look at the schedule in our website. But back to, to, to here on Zoom. Thank you, uh, to Dr. Tulio. Thank you, Dr. West, Donna West, for your commentaries and, uh, and answers. So now uh, the audience is free to speak, to ask questions, to uh, share a commentary. So the floor, the floor is open. 